Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Mar, and, uh, and thank you very much for this, uh, the invitation to, uh, to this conference. Um, let me start by, by thanking the Central Bank of Chile and, uh, and uh, Governor Marcel for inviting me to what is my fourth time at this conference. Um, the first time was in 1999, and it was far smaller, uh, and, uh, and I, I've enjoyed it ever since. I think of it as the premier conference in central banks in, uh, in this region. Um, let me say a few words about this paper, because I think it's important to understand a little bit about the context. Um, it's written, as, uh, as Mar said, with, uh, with Kim Schoenholtz of the NYU Stern, and um, it was actually commissioned by Vice Chair, Fed Vice Chair Rich Clarida as part of the uh, framework review for, uh, for the Federal Reserve's Open Market Committee. Um, there were papers, uh, there are papers and there's, uh, there's work on objectives, tools, and communication. This is the primary paper on communication. Um, when we wrote the paper, the idea was to directly address uh, issues that we believe are relevant to FOMC communication. Um, I've known many of you for a long time, and so I think you know that I try very hard, even though I live in the United States most of the time, not to be US-centric. But in this case, it was unavoidable, and it's actually intentional. Um, I, I believe that, uh, that, that communication is a very culturally dependent thing. It depends on, uh, on the nature of a, of a society as well as the institutional framework within which a, uh, something like a central bank operates. And so it's certainly a case where one size do not, does not fit all. Uh, some of the lessons that, that I think come from this review uh, may, be, may be reasonable to, to, uh, to transfer to other to other jurisdictions, but I'm going to leave that to others. Um, so let me um, let me figure out which way to go here. Um, so uh, central banks um, have m the, and the and the Federal Open Market Committee um, make policy in an environment that's uh, fraught with unavoidable uncertainty. Um, but there's one source of noise that policymakers can and should uh, should reduce, and that's the uncertainty that they themselves create. Um, when policy is transparent and credible, uh, people and markets uh, respond to data, not to policymakers. And, um, and, and I see this as the overriding objective of central bank communication. It's to ensure that people are not responding to you per se. Um, now, to, I, I think it's important for me to place the evaluation of uh, US monetary policy communications in context. and. Um, and to start with, I want to emphasize the enormous progress that's been made in the United States. Um, I wasn't, I didn't realize that uh, Bill English would be here uh, today. He should gi be giving this part of the presentation. He lived through it uh, at much closer hand than I did. Uh, but uh, let me start here uh, because I think it's important to put, as I said, to put this into context. So March 1993 is when the Federal Reserve uh, Open Market, Federal Open Market Committee began publishing minutes following meetings. These followed the following meeting, so it was always uh, after the following meeting. So they were already stale. Uh, February 1994 is when they began issuing statements when, uh, when there were policy changes. So it's important to keep in mind that before February of 1994, the Federal Reserve Open, the Federal Open Market Committee did not announce changes in policy publicly. There was a cottage industry in determining whether or not people thought that policy changed. And the most interesting thing for me about this is that it, it gave enormous uh, discretionary power to the chair if you go back and read the history. Um, and uh, so that's 1994. May 1999, a period when I was actually there, uh, they began issuing statements after, after every meeting. Uh, so that's, I think, a, th those, are, those are important dates. Now, what did these statements look like? Here's the first statement from February of uh, 1994. Um, it's 100 words long, and I'll be emphasizing what I, a, 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 a complexity measure that I'll, I'll just label as a grade level. This is a, um, it's uh, something by uh, that you can use in natural language processing. So this is the first. This is the first uh, of these. It's a hundred words long, and uh, and it's readable by someone basically with a a mid-level university education is the idea. Um, this is. I'm not intending anybody to read this or those. Um, and, and again, with uh, due respect to Bill, who probably wrote this one. Um, 
this, uh, this, is, this is the longest and most complex one. It's from 2013, which was a very, a very, very difficult period. A lot of things are being announced. Um, this is 800 words long and has a grade level of uh, 21, which, is, uh, which, which basically means you need an advanced degree. So um, I'm not sure, do I actually qualify as grade level 21? I might. It's close. Um, and um, and this, is a, this is a plot of what happened to the statements uh, of the FOMC from 1999 to 2019. The size of the dots is the, uh, is the length of the statements. The vertical axis is this grade level measure. Uh, the horizontal axis is time. And, uh, and the different dots are different chairs. And so what you can see is that, uh, that certainly during the period of the crisis and uh, during the period of the Bernanke uh, chairmanship, uh, things were getting progressively longer and progressively more complex. Uh, recently, they've been getting shorter and, uh, and simpler to read, although I would argue not, uh, not, simple, not simple enough. Um, here's some more dates, just in terms of the history. Um, there's a, the, one of the appendices to this rather long paper uh, that, that I have here is, um, goes through all of this and discusses it in, in a little bit more detail. Um, the, the next date is November 2007, which is the first summary of economic projections. Uh, this is when it is that the Federal Open Market Committee began releasing its projections of growth, inflation, and unemployment. Those became progressively more complex, and, it's, uh, uh, and I'll, I'll have a, a bit more to say about that in a few minutes. Um, April 2011, the quarterly press conferences began. Um, and interestingly, on January, uh, in January of 2012, the Federal Open Market Committee began publishing this thing called the Statement on Longer Run Goals. Now, importantly, I think it's important, um, you know, individual words can be very important. The use of the word on rather than of is really important here because it is not a statement of goals because the goals are part of the mandate that's given by the, uh, by, by the, um, by the Congress and not um, something that the F1 itself is um, is determining. Um, let me. I, I, this is a violation of my normal slide rules to put up full sentences. Um, but here are two excerpts from the statement that I'm going to uh, read in a second. And in thinking about this, keep in mind that the Fed's mandate is, and again I quote, maximum employment, stable prices, and moderate long-term interest rates. Um, Clearly, stable prices and long-term interest rates are consistent with each other, so no one really mentions the, the latter of those two. Uh, there's an issue about maximum employment and its potential conflict with stable prices, at least in the short run. Um, and, uh, and, and that's why these two sentences exist, in my view. Um, also, if you're going to pick a date when the when the U.S. started targeting inflation, if you believe that they're an inflation targeter, uh, this would be the date, would be January. Uh, I'm sorry, this is the most recent one from January 2019, but the, the date is, uh, is 2012. Um, so the important thing here is that they've chosen, uh, they've chosen an inflation objective um, and they've chosen the metric to use. And, uh, but with unemployment, they said the maximum level of employment is largely determined by non-monetary factors. Constant, consequently, it would not be appropriate to specify a fixed goal for employment. Um, they do estimate that the long-run unemployment rate uh, that's consistent with that is 4.4%. Uh, and so that's all in the that's all in the statement. Um, the final two, the final item on here is uh, 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 the next item is that that the summary of economic projections, this thing that I refer to as the SEP, it starts to include um, interest rate projections in. Uh, January of 2012. That was not included in the first five years. So you see these things evolving um, very slowly. And the summary of economic projections includes a table that looks like this, which again, I don't expect you to be able to read, but, um, but this is the most recent one from June of, uh, of 2019. And it includes real GDP growth, unemployment rate, uh, inflation in two measures. And then at the bottom it says projected appropriate policy paths. I'll have a few more things to say about that. Um, the median is in, at the beginning. The, the thing to note here is that there is, they're doing it for several years ahead, plus there's something called longer run. 
Um, and uh, and you, you can decide sort of what you think that means. Uh, this is a thing called the dot plot that people focus on in the news a lot, uh, just so that you can see one. I don't know if it's actually very visible. It's hard to get decent versions of this. Um, uh, but this is again the most recent one. The important thing about this, um, the important thing about this is to uh, is to is to keep in mind that this is uh, the answer to the question of what individuals uh, who are responding think is appropriate policy. So it's not a forecast. It's really, really important to, to keep in mind that, that this thing called the summary of economic projections is not a forecast. It's not, they're not asking people, what do you think is going to happen? They're asking them, what do you think appropriate policy is, go is going forward? So those are, those are quite different things. Um, this is my final historical slide because um, at the beginning of this year, uh, there was a change to, uh, to, to a press conference now following every meeting, um, which of course has been the, been the case in a number of central banks uh, for, for many, many years. So in that sense, the, um, the US is, is a little behind. So in the, in the context of all of this, the question that, that, um, that, that Kim Schoenholz and I asked is whether or not we can find further improvements to the communications framework, keeping in mind that lots of things um, have happened over the last quarter century and that the performance of the economy has been pretty good, uh, at least with respect to the things that the Federal Reserve can control. I mean, if you just look at inflation over the last 25 years, average inflation in the, uh, in the uh, in the personal consumption expenditure price index has been very close to 2%. Um, so it's almost as if they're targeting a, a, a pr it's almost like a price level target um, uh, and the, because the average has been so close to that objective. So, um, so we ask about improving communication. Um, to answer this question, we, um, we first we talked to a lot of people. We talked to roughly two dozen former officials, academics, and uh, market economists. Um, all of whom uh, were very, very generous with their time, and they, uh, they agreed to allow us quote them in the paper. So you'll see a number of quotes if you look at the paper with attribution. Um, and, um, and their names are all listed at the end of the, uh, at the, end of the paper as well. Um, now, their responses led us to organize our recommendations uh, around four objectives. First of all, unsurprisingly, we think all communication should always be linked to the annual statement on goals. This is very similar to the fact that uh, that most, most central banks, when they communicate, are, are linking their communication explicitly to their mandate. And that makes a tremendous amount of sense. Um, the second thing uh, that we have is that we think that it's very important to simplify public statements. Um, and, and I put in here, while conveying divergences of views, this is important for the Federal Reserve. The simplicity, I think, is a, is a general lesson. I think it's very, very important that central banks uh, View uh, view the public as a primary uh, as a as a as a primary objective of their communication, um, especially in p in a period now where central bank independence in a lot of the world is no longer quite uh, taken quite for granted as it has been in the past. Um, the third thing is to clarify how policy will react to changes in conditions, and the fourth one is to highlight policy uncertainty. Um, I'm going to talk about each one of these a little bit more. So, um, so first of all, um, we see the we see the we see the annual statement on goals um, as the foundation of all the communication for the FOMC. Um, the statement does start with the mandate from the Federal Reserve Act, and then it discusses uh, prices and and employment, as I as I showed you uh, from a few things uh, a moment ago. The second, the second objective, <coughs> is to simplify statements. Um, and um, for key communication, this means using simple language to reach the broadest possible audience. I think it's very important to, to think about going over the heads, if you will, of financial journalists. There are a lot of other ways to communicate with, <coughs> excuse me, there are a lot of other ways to communicate with more sophisticated audiences, but the primary objective uh, of this has to be to adopt practices and norms that emphasize uh, communication to the public at large. Um, the third thing is uh, is to 
is to communicate how it is policy is likely to react to changing conditions. Um, so the idea here is that when growth, inflation, and financial conditions deviate from what was expected or what was forecast, how will policymakers systematically and predict predictably change their policy? Um, what's the reaction function in normal times, and what's going to happen if, as is, has been the case in recent years in the advanced world, what, what's going to happen when, uh, when you hit the effective lower bound on conventional monetary policy? Um, as I say this, I think it's very important to distinguish <laughs> between statements about um, statements about economic outlook and statements about and interest rate guidance, um, if people understand the policymakers' reaction function, the guidance about interest rates is only going to be important when there's a desire to provide additional stimulus beyond what was normally what would normally occur. Um, and so I, I think that there are good reasons not to want to publish interest rate paths, and we can go into that uh, again later if you like. Um, so thinking about this, as I suggest, leads to the summary of economic projections, and, um, and I'll, have, I'll, have a bit more, I'll have a bit more to say about that, um, about that in a minute. Um, the fourth objective is about, um, is about policy uncertainty and risks. Um, so the, the, one of the really important things here is that if you're going to retain credibility as policymakers, it's important not to claim that you know things that you don't know. So, um, so I think it, it's, it, it's then important to explain what you don't know and not, as Mervyn King said to us in an interview, not apologize for it. Um, and, um, and I want to... Um, I just want to emphasize how much uncertainty there is. There's already a huge amount of uncertainty that's disclosed, that the FOMC itself discloses in the information that they provide. And many central banks disclose information <coughs> in various ways about uncertainty. But um, in the most recent summary of economic predictions, on the, on the basis of historical error bands, there's an even chance, an even chance, that the, that the policy rate, which is currently 2.5%, is going to be between 1.0 and 4.2%, okay? There's an even chance that it will be outside of that range, all right? Okay, so that, this, is, this is the level of uncertainty. Um, and given the wide range, um, we, saw, we see little purpose for policymakers to respond to questions like, how many interest rate increases or decreases do you believe are appropriate over the next year? And for the FOMC and the FOMC participants, it's particularly a problem, I believe, to have what I would describe as 19 versions of forward guidance that are being, dis that are being uh, sort of publicized separately. This, I think, is a severe problem that there is no really very good solution to at the moment institutionally. Um, so I, I think, though, that there are modest, modest, modest changes that could have uh, substantial improvements. So, um, so now in, the, in my remaining time, uh, let me try and go through a few things very quickly. We, oh, we asked, um, we asked in, in a set of 2,000 interviews three questions that were pretty open-ended about the objectives of the FOMC, about how the communication should evolve over time, and about what the challenges were. Um, we got a bunch of responses. Here, here's a plot of, um, of the frequency of responses among, the, among these participants. So the primary one was that they thought that the FOMC should do a better job of, of trying to communicate its reaction function. And the second was that they should be, do a better job on policies and risks. The third one has to do with this dot plot, which is a little bit esoteric. But in the case of the, in the, case of the Federal Open Market Committee, um, keep in mind that every member, uh, actually all of the, these, there's a distinction between a member who votes and a participant who doesn't, so this is, this is a, this is a institutional quirk of the American system. Um, but the, the, uh, the idea is that we don't know, we can't connect 
until sometime later, a number of years later, we can't connect a particular projection for inflation with one for growth or unemployment with one for the interest rate. And so there isn't what, what people refer to as a matrix that connects those. And I think that that, that would be uh, something that would be quite useful. Um, now, um, let me skip that because I, I want to get us back on time. So let me talk a little bit about the summary of economic projections and the information that's included in it. Um, there's a, there is a lot of information that's in this. Um, so if you, if you assume that, representative, that, that you have a representative policymaker and you interpret uh, the data as coming from a simple reaction function, you can actually estimate something kind of interesting because you can collect, uh, there are 105 of these out there. Uh, that's how many you've got. And you can estimate a sort of simple Taylor rule off of them because uh, you have a lot of information. We'll talk about more about exactly how to do this, but you have, you, you know everybody thinks that inf the inflation objective is two. Everybody tells you what the, what their equilibrium, long-run equilibrium unemployment rate is going to be, and you can estimate this thing. Um, it, it fits actually, I thought, kind of remarkably well. The interesting thing is that the, uh, the coefficient on inflation is way bigger than the coefficient on unemployment, um, and, uh, and, and, and like way bigger. And maybe this is a common thing to see, but I, I thought it was pretty interesting. What's, what's more interesting to me than that was that I can actually recover as a estimate, uh, uh, an estimate of the implied equilibrium real rate from this because it's, the, it's like the constant term in your regression, if you want, and you can estimate it changing over years, and you have enough uh, information to do this. So the solid line in the bottom is from 2012 to 2018, roughly, what the estimated short-run uh, real interest rate was um, implied by the projections that these people were uh, we're putting out. So what's interesting is it starts below zero in 2012, which shouldn't surprise anyone. And um, the top dashed line is their uh, their own disclosed um, estimate of the longer run real rate. And and what what I find interesting here is that they're sort of coming together. Um, but you can get a lot of this is pretty this I find this graph pretty informative, and you can get a lot of information from this. Um, but I promise to to finish uh, in excess with, with a little time left over. But um, so uh, th this business about the matrix. So the problem that you face right now is you, you don't really know very much about the individual, uh, the individual participants' views. And you, you don't know their reaction functions. And since this is a committee, you have no idea this, about the stability of the committee's consensus. Um, but you could actually extract that if you, if you had more information. Um, and uh, the other thing is that I think that um, we actually believe that you should probably be forced, people should be forced to disclose their own uh, forecasts and that this would, this would foster uh, systematic uh, policy and enhance the quality of the deliberations uh, in, the, uh, in the meeting. Um, but that's a secondary point. Um, on the point about uncertainty, as I said a, a minute ago, the historical projection error ranges are quite large. Um, and I believe they're, they're severely underutilized. So here's, here are the 70% ranges for the numbers in the most recent summary of economic projections. So the median projection for inflation over in 2020, I'm sorry, this is for 2021. Uh, so this is for the end of 2021. So that's, uh, that's roughly 30 months ahead uh, is what this is. And so everybody thinks that inflation is going to be 2%, growth 1.8. Unemployment 3.8, which is pretty low, and that the federal funds rate will be 2.5. Now, these are not very big deviations from where things are kind of now, um, but the ranges are quite large. The uncertainty is quite large. Uh, you know, unemployment could go down to 2%, seems a little unlikely, up to 5.6, at least to me, if they'd asked me. Um, but the federal funds rate then uh, has this very wide range if you want to know the interest rate. Um, this picture here is disclosed. Um, this is buried inside of the Summary of Economic Projections. It's actually published three weeks after 
the meeting when the initial data are published, which I think is nuts. There's no reason not to publish all of the information together. Um, but this, this is the picture of, that they disclose that is essentially a fan chart where the solid red line is the median for the federal funds rate and the, um, and the, the fan chart is the 70% uh, confidence band based on, historical, uh, based on historical data. Now there would be ways of doing this that are not based on historical data, uh, but I think that our view was that they should highlight this. Now, um, so in thinking about recommendations, uh, going back to where I started, focus on objectives to improve communication. So first of all, always link to, uh, to the annual statement of goals, um, simplifying the statements, clarifying how, to, uh, how you're going to react to changing conditions to help people understand your reaction function, and highlight uncertainty and risks. Um, now, we have two examples that we've done in the paper. I'm not going to show you these, um, but we rewrote uh, a post-meeting statement, and we uh, also rewrote the summary of economic projections. Um, and in the case of the post-meeting statement, we basically focused on only three elements, a statement of the decision, the rationale for the decision, and a discussion of uncertainties and risks. Um, that's it. I think that's what you need. Um, in terms of the principles, we said this thing should be readable at a very, at a pretty elementary level by somebody who's basically gone to high school in the United States. Um, it should link to the longer run um, goals and it should foster group accountability. This is another thing that was, that I didn't mention earlier, but it's very strange about a lot of central bank communication is it's sort of like spoken about in a disembodied third voice. Third, uh, third person. You should really, uh, I think that people need to own these things. And the way to do that is for the FOMC to, to speak about themselves as we um, and our decision. And that, I think, uh, it's sort of helpful. Um, if, you look at, uh, if you look at the post-meeting statement uh, in terms of the number of words and the grade level complexity, we wrote two, we rewrote two of these. Uh, December 2017, which was the last time there was a dissent, um, there's a decline in the size from 427 words to 270, and a decline in the grade level from 16.3 to 12.5. This really doesn't, I mean, you know, um, you could get professionals to do this. We're not professionals. I just sat there one day and like, did this stuff, and you can do it, and you can really knock this down. But if you had communication professionals, I'm sure you could do a way better job. In terms of the concise, uh, concise report on economic projections, uh, which we hesitate to not call an inflation report because it's about way more than inflation, we think that there should be a highlight on fan charts. There should be a short narrative that describes modal outcomes and uncertainty, and there should be a data appendix with a bunch of stuff in it. Um, and again, the principles should be that it should be easy to read, linked to the statement on long-term goals, and foster group accountability. Um, the, the, um, the model for this is something uh, that the Bank of England has been doing for a while, which is a visual version of their inflation report. That, that just has a bunch of, um, it just has a bunch of figures in it, and it has like tweetable headers. Okay, I think we have to really think about this. Is, it sounds, sounds sort of dumb at some level, but it's really, I think, pretty important. Here's a fan chart and an uncertainty and risks chart from the June 2019 Summary of Economic Pro Projections for Inflation. So again, you can see that inflation over the, the 30 months could be is equally likely at the 70% level to between 1% and 3%. The interesting thing here are the bottom two charts. The first one on the on your left is an answer to the question about whether or not uncertainty is broadly similar, lower, or higher than historically. And the third one is whether or not the risks to your, uh, to your projection are roughly balanced, weighted to the downside or weighted to the upside. And the interesting thing here is that there was a shift um, where now things are more, bet, more towards the downside than they were previously. But importantly, the uncertainty is about what it was uh, historically, so um, so the recommendation then is to is to is to change these things. So the benefits is are then to emphasize the longer run goals, broaden access, 
shift to a focus of, on uncertainties and risks. Um, and, uh, and we think that this would help to coordinate external communication uh, and in improve the quality of the, of the internal debate. And then on, on the, the last two, I think that the objective, uh, another objective has to be to set up a system in which the, um, in which the 19 people uh, do have some discipline imposed on, on what it is that they're going to say uh, so that, that they, uh, they don't all answer the question of how many interest rate increases do you think there are going to be uh, in the next year. So, uh, and with that, I hit your five minutes left. So thank you very much.